In this video, we're going to be looking at how to actually calculate a bunch of different probabilities. So we're going to be taking a look at really a few different things. We're going to start off taking a look at our addition rule. So that's when we have a union between two events. And you're like, whoa, union between two events? What, what does that mean? Well, that just means we have two events. We want to know, hey, what's the probability that we witness either event A or event B? What we're then going to move on to is taking a look at our rules of multiplication. And the multiplication rules are going to be taking a look at our intersection between points. And again, that sounds all fancy, intersection between events. What we're looking at there is, hey, what is the probability that we witness event A and also witness event B? So we'll be taking a look at those two things. We'll then carry on taking a look at a few other kind of tools with probability. We'll look at how to compute probability from a uh, tree diagram from contingency tables, and we'll also have a brief little foray into taking a little look at Bayes' theorem as well. That's our plan for calculating probabilities. Let's uh, move on and start off taking a look at our rules of addition, and that is our union between two events. Let's take a look at that. So in thinking of a union between two events, what we want to think about is our entire space here. So let's just draw a little box. And what we're going to let this box represent is all possible outcomes. Right? So here we go. We're going to have all of our outcomes. This is everything that could possibly happen. Say we're rolling a bunch of dice. This would be all of the possible space that could be accounted for in the results of rolling the dice. Picking cards from a deck of cards, etc., etc., etc. Well, let's say that we have one that we're interested in, which is taking up this area, this space, right? And we'll call this event A, right? So event A takes up this area out of our total outcomes. And what we're looking for is, well, probability of event A. And we've taken a look at how we can do this with our classical probabilities or our empirical probabilities, depending on the case. And okay, it wasn't so bad. But what if we also had event B? All right, so okay, we also have event B here. And maybe both of these guys are of interest to us. And that is, we want to know, okay, we have event A, we have event B. But we want to figure out, hey, what is the probability that I have event A union event B? And, okay, a little fancy little operator there. Really what this means, and this is how we're going to simplify it when we look at this course, is we're just going to say, hey, what's the probability that I have event A or event B occurring? Right, having one or the other. And what we're going to do in order to calculate this, we're going to be taking a look at a few different rules. And that is going to be our addition rule. Underneath our addition rule, we're going to have two subcategories. Our first bit underneath the addition rule is going to be our special, our special addition rule. And what we need for our special addition rule is that our two events, our two events, uh, sorry, let's back that up, not our two events. We could have more than two. We could have five events if we wanted to. So underneath our special rule, we just need for our events to be mutually exclusive. That is, if we witness event A, we do not witness event B. And right, if we think about this in our Venn diagram, that's exactly the case. Imagine throwing a dart at this board, and you could either fall just in the all outcomes, in which case neither event A or event B happens. You could throw a dart, and you could end up, boom, in here in event A, in case, okay, there we go, event A has happened. And you could throw a dart, and you could have it wound, wind up in event B. And there we go, event B happened, woo, we have that as a success. But what you can't have happen is you cannot throw a single dart and have it land in both A and B. 
right? You, by witnessing one, by witnessing B, we do not witness A. Or if we witness A, we do not witness B. There's no overlap between these two probability areas. So in this sense here, these two events are mutually exclusive. And that's what we need as an assumption, as a requirement for our special addition rule. For our special addition rule then, we can work out probability of A or probability of B occurring as just quite simply the probability that event A occurs plus the probability that event B occurs. And that way there, we would have our addition rule, the probability of witnessing one or the other event. And let's, let's take a look at an example of this kind of special addition rule. Let's imagine that you have your standard deck of 52 cards. And here, let's, let's quickly talk about cards because for many of you, this is very straightforward, but cards are used a lot in statistic for this whole probability bit. There's many questions about cards that come up and it's just kind of assumed that you understand how cards work. There is in cards, ultimately two colors. There is black and there is red. Underneath red, you're going to have your diamonds and you're going to have your hearts. Underneath the black, you're going to have your clubs, which is something like that. And you're going to have your spades. So we have four suites all together, four suits, I mean, sorry, not suites, four suits. Half the suits are black, half the suits are red. In each of these suits then, we will then have our cards, which will go, depending if ace is high or ace is low, doesn't really matter in our case, but we'll go ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, and king. And then the same thing will be repeated for our clubs, for our hearts, and for our diamonds. So that is all together, we're going to have four aces, one for each suit. We're going to have four sevens, one for each suit. Very similarly, you would have two black sevens, and very similarly, you would have two red sevens. Right, so a little bit of a, a little bit of a layout about a deck of cards, just so that if you weren't necessarily familiar with this, you're not completely lost when these card style questions come up. Okay, all of that little aside, let's go take a look at a question. You have a standard deck of 52 cards. You are going to pull out. What are we going to say? You're going to pull out a card at random. And this one card that you pull out, you want to know, hey, what is the probability that that card you've pulled out is either a jack or a king, right? So one card being pulled out, what's the likelihood that it's either a jack or a king, right? If we think about this back up with our Venn diagram, we have all the possible cards that could be pulled out. This is our four possible jacks, this is our four possible kings. We couldn't accidentally pick a jack king, right? There's, there's no such card. So it's either you pick out some other random card, maybe a two, or you pick a jack, or you pick a king. So let's go back and work this out. They are mutually exclusive, right? By pulling out a jack, you don't get a king. So we can use our special edition rule which is just simply going to be probability of getting a jack plus the probability of getting a king. In this case here, what's our probability of getting a jack? Well, we have 52 cards all together. I'm going to have jack, 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 and jack, right? There's going to be four jacks there. So probability of getting a jack is four out of 52. All right, 4 out of 52, that's going to be the same thing as, what, 1 out of 13? 
And then same thing, probability of getting a king. Well, king, 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 king. So again, 4 out of 52. Again, okay, 4 divided by 4 is 1. 52 divided by 4 is 13. So again, we get 1 out of 13. Altogether, we can work this out. Probability of getting a jack or a king. That's going to be 2 out of 13. If we want to express that as a decimal, that's 0.1538. So we can just leave it at that. 0.15 or 15%. So, okay, 15% chance that we pick a card at random and it's one or the other. So that's our special rule in action, finding out probability of event A or event B. We can also work out a little bit of an other little bit. This is attached to our addition rule. This would be our complement rule. And we could work out that, okay, for some event A, say that the probability of event A occurring is 25%. Well, we could then similarly work out the probability of not A, right? So, okay, probability we witness A is 25%. Well, then the probability that we witness not A, that is we don't have A, that's going to be 1 minus our probability of A. Or 1 minus 25% is going to be 1 minus, so that's going to give us what? 75% in that case there. If we want to think about this whole complement rule in terms of a Venn diagram again, we can do that. We can do that. Let's get our whole space here. We would have our event of interest. So there we go. There's A. Well, if this is A, all of this extra space in our box is not A. So, right, the opposite. Everything that's not A there. So we could work out A versus not A using our complement rule. In fact, if we recall back to when we were taking a look at our empirical rule, we already did this. When we were using our empirical rule in the last video there, we were trying to find out, hey, what's the probability of a male? And all we had was number of female to number of trials. And we worked out one minus probability of female to give us the probability of male. So same idea happening here. We're now just formalizing it and calling it our complement rule. So we have that. But what happens? What happens if we have a case where our assumption cannot be met? All right, so keep in mind, our big assumption for our special edition rule was that the events are mutually exclusive. So that is, if we went back up and took a look at this, I could not throw a dart at this board and get the dart to go in both A and B at the same time. Right, it would fall in one, the other or in neither, right? It couldn't be in both A, B. If events are not mutually exclusive, well, we would have a Venn diagram space that would look more like this. So, okay, we have our space of all of our outcomes again. So here's all of our outcomes. And then we're gonna have event space A. As such and we're gonna have event space B as such and we notice that we have this overlap between the two that is now events A and B are not mutually exclusive I could throw a dart and okay maybe sometimes I would just hit event A maybe sometimes I would just hit event B right, over in this blue shaded area. Sometimes I might hit way out over here somewhere and get neither, but every now and then I'm going to get right here where we have overlap, where we have both A and B occurring at the same time. This is problematic, right? We no longer have this mutual exclusivity going on. 
So this is where, when we no longer have this ooh, events are mutually exclusive, this was our assumption. Assumption for our special. If this assumption does not hold, we need to use our general addition rule. And what our general addition rule is, is it's saying, okay, same idea. Let's say we want to know, hey, what's our probability of witnessing event A or event B? So event A or event B, right? Again, sometimes you may see this written as a union. Would be the probability that A happens plus the probability that B happens. We would then have to subtract off the point where these two overlap or where they intersect each other. So we'd have to subtract off the point where we have probability of A and B, or if we want to use our correct notation, okay, A probability of B, it would be saying we would subtract off that intersection point. So where A intersects B, we would subtract off. So here, U union, this little, almost like an N, this is our intersection. That green bit there where A and B intersect each other. We would have to subtract that because otherwise we would count it when we counted A, we would count it again when we counted B, and we'd actually double count this green area. So in order to prevent us from double counting it, we have to subtract it off. So let's look at an example where we can work through this. Again, let's go and take a look at where we're pulling out cards from a deck of cards. So 52 cards in a deck. In this case, I want to know, hey, what is the probability that I pull out a jack or a hearts? So, okay, what's, what's going on here? Jack or a hearts, are these two events mutually exclusive? Well, let's go back up and we can take a look at all of our possible cards. Okay, what do we have? Well, we have a jack here. We have four jacks all together that could be, but oh look, we have overlap here such that we could also pull out this jack of hearts. And okay, if we pull out this jack of hearts, we have overlap between these two events, pulling out a heart and pulling out a jack, I'm gonna have issue. So I need to subtract off this overlap. And let's see, let's see how that works. So, okay, first bit, we wanna know, okay, what's the probability that I get a jack? I wanna know what's the probability I have a heart. And then I need to subtract off that overlap. So subtract off the probability that I have a jack and a heart. That is a jack of hearts, right? So working that through. Probability of a jack, well, there's four out of 52 occurring there. That's one out of 13. Probability of a heart, well, we have four suits all together. Hearts are one of those suits, so that's gonna be one out of four. I'll just carry that down again. And then minus a jack of hearts. Well, how many jack of hearts are there? This is only one out of 52, all right? One out of 52. So. Here, actually, let's, uh, let's make this so that we can just do all the algebra the same. One out of four, uh, what's that gonna be? That's gonna be 13 out of 52. So we could do, hey, same denominator all the way across. We could either turn these in decimals, calculate it that way, or same denominator, I can just add the numerators. Four plus 13 gives me 17 minus one, 16 out of 52 is going to be my probability in this case. What is it as a decimal? Well, 16 out of 52, that's the same thing as saying 0.30769, let's round that to 2, 0.31. All right, keep in mind that's saying we have a 31% probability occurring there. 31% chance that we pull out either a jack or a hearts. So we have our general rule working through. Again, special rule, 
if we can assume or if we know our events are mutually exclusive, if we cannot assume mutual exclusivity, we have to use our general rule. We have to subtract off this joint probability where we have the overlap, where we have the intersection between our two events. Next, let's take a look at joint probabilities. That is, okay, we worked this out pretty simply in our case. Let's work out some rules as to how we could calculate these joint probabilities through other methods. Let's take a look at that next. Okay, so for joint probabilities, what we are looking for is we are looking for the probability that both events occur. That is, we're looking for the likelihood of witnessing event A and event B together. We don't just want to witness one. We want to have the probability that we witness both at the same time. So keep in mind, okay, if we're witnessing both at the same time, they cannot be mutually exclusive, right? That's like saying, hey, what's the probability that I witness a heads and a tails on a coin flip? Well, you can't witness a heads and a tails on a single coin flip. You're going to witness a heads or a tails, but not both. So can't have mutually exclusive events going on here. Well, you could, but you're going to get a probability of zero. These joint probabilities, this is the intersection between those two probability spaces in our Venn diagram. So this is the point where A intersects B, where we have overlap. Right, and again, if we want to think about these Venn diagrams, what do we have going on here? We have, boom, so we have all of our outcome space. We're going to have event A. We're going to have event B. B, not D. And so we have our event B space. We have our event A space. And then that overlap part there where both of these guys intersect. I'll do this in green just to really highlight that this is the difference point. That there, that is the point where we have both A and B. It's where we have intersection of our two. And that point there, that's what we're looking for in these joint probabilities. This intersection, this point where both occur. When you throw a dart at this dartboard, it hits both events simultaneously, right? Boom, we land right in the middle there. So, okay, in working out our joint probabilities, we are again going to be having, well, for our just probabilities A or B, our union of events, we had a special and a general addition rule. For our joint probabilities, we will again have a special and a general, in this case here, multiplication rule. So, okay, again, addition rule for A or B, multiplication rule for A and B, or A intersect B. What do we have? Well, for our special, our special multiplication rule, we need to have two events which are independent. And let's talk about what we mean by this independency. So two events are independent if the outcome of one event does not influence the likelihood or the outcome of the other event. So some examples of some independent events. Let's say that I flip a coin and I roll a dice. Okay, if I flip a coin and this guy gives me heads, well, keep in mind, heads on that coin flip has no impact on the outcome of the dice roll. None whatsoever. So in this case here, these two events are completely independent. Same thing, right? Same thing if instead of rolling a dice, Let's say I flip two coins. I flip a coin and then I flip a coin again. Well, in this case here, just because I got head on that coin flip has zero impact on what the result of this coin flip will be. 
these two flips will be entirely independent of one another. I could flip a coin 20 times. I could get 19 heads. Doesn't matter, right? There was 19 heads in a row. Pure fluke, right? Just complete luck. Has no influence at all on the likelihood, on that probability of the 20th coin. They are all 100% independent of each other. So dependent events then are, okay, because this thing happened, you're now more likely to have this other event. And we'll get to that. We'll talk about our general rule shortly. But let's, let's take a look at the special first. And then once we work through the special, we'll come and we'll take a look at our general. So special multiplication rule. We are looking for the probability of witnessing A and B, the intersection between event A and event B. Well, quite simply, we can work this guy out as the probability of A times the probability of B. So we can work this through with an example we just looked at, right? That is, we could say, hey, what is the probability of getting a jack of hearts? And okay, we worked that through already, but we know that, okay, that there is actually the probability of getting a jack and a heart, right? Picking out a card and it being that intersection between the two. So, okay, probability of a jack, that's going to be 4 out of 52 times probability of a heart. That's going to be 13 out of 52. Or we can do this another way. We could say 1 out of 13 times probability. So 3 out of 52. That's 1 quarter. And we can work this through and say, okay, 1 13 times 1 quarter. That gives us 0 0.019. So let's just round that. 2% chance of us pulling a jack of hearts out of our card deck. Well, okay, very similarly, we know, right, we took a look at this, there's only one jack of hearts. So that is one jack of hearts, 52 cards. Instead of working through all this, can't we just say, hey, one over 52? Yeah, yeah, we could. If we work that out, what's that? 0 0.019. Or, right, that's actually what that guy there was, 0 0.02, 2%. So that is, okay, in our last example, when we were dealing with, hey, probability of A or B, and we were using our general rule, and we worked out, hey, what's the probability of pulling out that jack of hearts just intuitively? Well, we could have also done it using this special multiplication rule to getting the same results, right? Exact same results in this case. Let's take a look at another example as to how exactly we can use this. And let's go take a look here. Let's erase this. Okay, in this, in this uh, example, let's uh, presume a little bit differently. Let's say that we have 500 tourists to Victoria. And okay, right, Victoria, BC. We're not talking about in Australia. Victoria, BC. And in this case here, we surveyed these 500 tourists and we got the following information. We have that 280, 280 went to Butcher Gardens. So we'll just say 280 went to the gardens. We'll say that 300 visited Chinatown, downtown there, right? Canada's oldest Chinatown. And finally, we'll say that 50, they did a little bit of a trek and they went and they hiked out and looked at the Kinsel Trestle. So, okay, we have this following kind of breakdown. What we'll presume is, we will presume, and it's entirely an assumption at this point, we will assume that these events are independent. That is, there was no kind of deal, like, hey, if you go to Chinatown, we'll then bring you to the gardens, so that people who went to Chinatown were more likely to go to the gardens. Or if you're going to the gardens, we'll also go for a little trip to the trestle. Right? No, we'll presume these are entirely independent events. There's no kind of deal or link that makes one causing another one to be more likely. So entirely independent. And at this point, it is just an assumption. And often, often we need to make these assumptions. So we have to assume independence given, given our information. 
okay, what's our question? We have all of this. What do we want to know? Let's say that we want to know what is the probability of picking out a tourist at random, so one out of these 500 here, and finding that this tourist had gone to both the gardens and Chinatown. So probability of gardens and Chinatown, what is that? Well, okay, probability of gardens and Chinatown. We have independence, so that's gonna work out to probability of gardens times probability of Chinatown. Well, okay, we can work that out. Ah, probability of gardens, that is 280 out of 500. Probability of Chinatown, right? Believe it or not, that's a C, CT for Chinatown. Our probability of Chinatown was 300 out of 500. So, okay, if we work that all together, what do we have? Ah, 280 out of 500, that gives me 56%. 300 out of 500, that gives me 60%. So, probability of gardens and Chinatown? Well, that's going to be probability of gardens times probability of, gar of uh, Chinatown, so 0.56 times 0.6. That's going to give me a probability that any tourist we picked at random has gone to both of 0.336. So 33.6 or 34% probability that some tourist we picked at random had gone to both the gardens and Chinatown. So we have our special multiplication rule being worked through in this case to find out our joint or our intersecting probabilities. Quick follow-up example, or not example, I guess question for you. What kind of probability are we using here? Are we using classical or empirical? And then same, same kind of follow-up question. Up here, oh, no, I erased it. Our previous example where we were dealing with cards, right? So our cards, cards, what did we have? Again, empirical or classical. Okay, well, in this case here, we ran 500 experiments, 500 trials, and what we're looking at is the proportion of event success to the total number of trials. That is, we are appealing to this law of large numbers. We're assuming 500 is enough. This is an empirical probability that we have discussed. These are empirical. When we were talking about cards, we didn't have to run trials. We didn't have to do the trick 500 times and figure out how many successes we had. We just went based off of our assumption that all outcomes were equally as likely. And because all outcomes were equally as likely, our card example prior was using our classical probabilities. So keep in mind, right, as you work through it, there really wasn't much difference in how we approached the problem, if any at all. But again, just to kind of recall that previous topic and to bring it forward with us, our classical versus empirical probabilities. Okay, let's take a look at our last one there. We had our general multiplication rule. General multiplication rule. So this is again, we're looking for times where we're having both event A and event B, the intersection of the two, where the two Venn diagrams overlap each other. And in this case, we have dependence, right? We're no longer having two independent events. That is, if A happens, it changes the probability of B, right? So a little delta notation there, just change, right? The change in, so in this case here, maybe that's not the right use of this, but it changes the probability of B. And then we can write that the other way too, that if B happens, 
it will change the probability of it. So, okay, we need to work through then how this is going to affect itself, how this is going to affect each other, and work out our probability of witnessing both A and B given this influence we have. And let's take a look at an example for that. Let's suppose that you are sitting on your deck and it's a hot summer day and we have our cooler sitting here. All right, there we go. Here's my attempt at drawing a nice cooler. And inside this cooler we have, what do we have? We have a whole bunch of beer. We have all together nine beer. And we'll say that of these nine beer, we're gonna have five which are Blue Buck, right? So good old local Phillips Brewery here in town. Five of them are going to be their Blue Buck brand, and four of them will be their Slipstream. We want to know, hey, what is the probability of reaching into this cooler and pulling out one of each? So the probability that we pull out a Blue Buck and a Slipstream. And we can work through this, right? We can work through, okay, what exactly would this work out to? And perhaps one way that we can kind of visualize this to start off is to kind of use what we would call a tree diagram. So a tree diagram, we're going to have our initial node, and then we're going to break off into the different kind of situations that could arise. And so let's take a look at that. So to start off, we reach in, and we have two possible outcomes that then arise. All right, I'm going to split up the colors just because I can. In fact, you know what? Might as well. There we go. So over here, I have my blue buck. And on the right, I have my slipstream. Such that my probability that I reached in and grabbed a slipstream is, well, there's floor four slipstreams and nine beers. So four out of nine versus on the other side, picking a blue buck. That is the probability that I picked a blue buck is going to be five out of nine. Okay. So two possible situations for that first beer that I grab, it could either be a blue buck or it could be a slipstream with the following probabilities. Going forward, I then have again my second beer could either be a blue buck again or it could be a slipstream. On this case, it could be a blue buck or it could be a slipstream. All right, and again, so slip, stream, slip, stream, and then blue is, oh, that's not a B. Let's try that again. Blue buck and blue buck. So, okay, I have my continuation here. In this case, okay, next step down, keep in mind one beer is now gone. All right, I've now taken it out of the cooler. So, instead of nine beer in the cooler, I now only have eight. If I've already picked a slipstream out, well, instead of there being four slipstream out of nine beers, boom, down here. Oh, no, let's change the colors. Let's pick it. Let's stay this the same. This is going to be the probability of pulling a slipstream given that I already have pulled a slipstream. This guy is going to be, well, okay, four out of nine for the first guy. So I've already pulled one out. So now I only have three left. I already pulled one out, so I only have eight left. So, okay, probability of my slipstream was initially four out of nine. I already have one, only three left in the cooler. I already took a generic beer out, so now there's only eight left altogether. Very similarly from the blue buck side, probability that I got a blue buck, given that I've already pulled out a slipstream, Right, so I already have a slipstream. 
what's my likelihood of getting a blue buck? Well, I've only pulled out a slipstream, so there's still five blue buck remaining, but there's only eight beer remaining altogether. So, okay, probability of a blue buck, given that I have a slipstream, five out of eight. Over to the other side, we can do the same kind of idea. Probability of a blue buck, five out of nine. Probability of another blue buck, well, okay, I already have one, so there's only four left, and I already pulled out one, so four out of eight. What is that? That is the probability that I've pulled out a blue buck, given that I've already pulled out a blue buck. Another extreme right here, well, this guy here. Probability that I get a slipstream, given that I already have a blue buck. So, all right, already had a blue buck. What's the likelihood that I get a slipstream in this case? Well, okay, how many slipstreams are there? None pulled out, so still four out of eight beer altogether left over, because one of them was already pulled out here. So, if we're trying to follow this through, our two scenarios that we're interested in in this case is first of all, that I get a blue buck, and then because I have a blue buck, I have a slipstream. Alternatively, I get a slipstream, and then I get a blue buck. So that is two possible scenarios. I have probability that I get a blue buck, and then, all right, so multiplication rule times probability that I get a slipstream. But what we have to keep in mind is that, okay, probability that I pulled out a slipstream was conditional on the fact that I already had a blue buck. So given that I've already had a blue buck, All right? So that's gonna be my probability that I have a blue buck and a slipstream working out in that way. But okay, keep in mind that this was only one of the possible situations. I could have pulled out a slipstream first and then wound up down this path. So I could have this scenario or this scenario. So I would also want to consider the opposite case, right? So that it was or probability of a slipstream times the probability that I pulled out a blue buck given that I've already had. A slipstream. And so if I work these guys out, what does that give me? Well, probability of a blue buck that there was five out of nine times my conditional probability here. So probability I'm pulling out a slipstream given the blue buck, that's going to be four out of eight. What do I have here? First one, probability of a slipstream, four out of nine. And then probability of a blue buck given a slipstream, that's that guy there, that's five out of eight. If we work out these guys here, well, what do we have? We have five over nine times four over eight. We get a 27.777, right? Sorry, 0 0.27777. So if we went around that to two decimal places, we'll say we have a 28%. Oh, I can make that look nicer than that. We have a 28% of that guy. And if we work out this one, we will surprise get the same result of 28. Meaning that altogether, what's the probability we witness this or this, right? The two possible cases. I'll add those both together and we'll get 0.28. 0.56. If you take the full values, it's 0.5555555. So again, we'll round to 0 0.56. That is okay to finish all of this off. What is the probability of reaching in and pulling out one of each? Pulling in, reaching in and pulling out one of each is a 56% chance of this happening. Now, you have a cool party trick. You can go to a party, you can be like, oh, there's nine beers in here, there's two types, there's five of one, four of the other. There's a just over a 50-50 chance that I can reach in and pull out one of each. 
you can amaze your friends with math. And they'll be like, wow, that guy's really cool. We're going to invite him to more parties. So there you go. You're welcome. Helping you with that where I can. Uh, one other thing that we can kind of take a look at, if we go back up to this, back up to this tree diagram, let's just make some room. Let's just drag all of this stuff down. What we can do is we can work out as we go through this, all of our probabilities. So, right, we just worked out this case here of, hey, what is the probability of a blue buck and a slipstream? All right, we have this at 0 0.2777. Probability of a slipstream and a blue buck. We have this guy at 0 0.2777. We could very similarly go, hey, what's the probability of a slipstream and a slipstream? So that'd be 4 over 9 times 3 over 8. That works out to be 0 0.1667. And then same idea over here. What's the probability I get a blue buck and a blue buck? Well, going through that. 5 over 9 times 4 over 8, and, sorry, 5 out of 9 times 4 out of 8, that gives us 0 0.2777. Okay, if we, and okay, we have a little bit of rounding here. Technically, I guess this is 0 0.2778, 8, Eight. That was kind of sloppy there. If we take the summation of this entire row, it should sum to one, right? And again, we were sloppy. We didn't necessarily have perfect rounding as we went through. We had good rounding, but just the nature of rounding, it might not work perfectly. But let's add it up. 0.2778 plus 0.2778 plus 0.2778 plus 0.1667. What do we get? We get this summing to 1.0001. So there we go. Yeah, rounding is what gave us this extra little one here. But essentially what this is saying is, hey, the probability of reaching into this cooler and getting a blue buck and a blue buck or a blue buck and a slipstream or a slipstream, right? Essentially the probability of pulling out any of these combinations is one. Right? If you reach into the cooler and grab out two beers, surprise, you're going to get two beers with certainty. That's, that's what it's telling us. But we can check our tree diagrams that we've done our probabilities correctly going through by working it out in this way and summing it to ensure that it equaled. So there's our tree diagrams. Good way to kind of work through some of our probabilities. Otherwise, going back, okay, General multiplication rule. What is it in its generic form? We just kind of jump straight into the example. Our general multiplication rule, if we want to think about it in its general form, probability of A and B is going to equal the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Now keep in mind, it doesn't matter if it's A and B or if it's B and A. So very similarly, right, we can write it this way, probability of B and A is the probability of B times the probability of A given B. So we can work it out either way in that case there. And that's really what we've done with these two middle flow throughs. We then just added those two together and got our, what was it, 50 something percent, 56 percent. Right, that was our summation of those two. So there we go. That is our probability rules. We had our addition rules for finding out, hey, probability of A or B. And we had our special if events were mutually exclusive. And we had our general for when they weren't. We then moved over to our multiplication rule. That was for looking for the intersection between two events, probability of event A and event B. And again, we had our special and our general. Special we could use if the events were independent. The outcome of one did not influence the other. And then our general if the events were not independent. That is the outcome of one event influenced the outcome of another.
What we're going to be taking a look at next, uh, this next bit is not in our textbook that we are utilizing this semester. The next bit is known as Bayes' theorem. We will take a look at a few examples of this. Don't get too caught up on it. It is more of an abstract theorem to many first-year stat students. Uh, it's not going to be a big part of the course. I don't even think there's any D2L questions on it. It's just kind of a, here you go, this exists. If you go on to higher levels, it may turn out to be important to you. So just so you kind of have this in your back pocket as, oh, okay, I've experienced it. Let's take a look at Bayes' theorem next. So in this section, what we're going to briefly take a look at is this concept of Bayes' theorem. A big thing that we're looking at in Bayes' theorem is our conditional probabilities. And what Bayes' theorem yields is, okay, we have the probability of A given that event B has already happened, right? So this is our conditional probability. B has happened. What's the likelihood of A occurring then? And we're going to set this equal to our probability of B given that A has happened times the probability of A all over our probability of B. Okay, and if we kind of keep in mind as to where this comes from, we saw in our previous case that we worked out hey, probability of blue buck and slipstream is equal to the probability of slipstream and blue buck, right? Just written the other way. Given that these are, of course, are not independent events, we wrote this as probability of blue buck times probability of slipstream given blue buck. And then we can say that that was equal to probability of slipstream times the probability of blue buck given slipstream. And okay, what? Wait, why? Why are we doing this? Well, okay, if we think about this as just A and B, that's B and A. Well, okay, we could do that's just probability of A times. Probability of B given A, all of that's going to be equal to probability of B times the probability of A given B. Right, all I've done, anytime I had blue buck, I replaced it with A. Anytime I had slipstream, I replaced it with B, just so we can match our generic kind of expression here. And then simple algebra, right? Algebraic voodoo, divide probability of B onto both sides. And what do I have? I have my probability of A times my probability of B given A all over my probability of B. That's going to equal my probability of A given that B's already occurred. That guy there, same as what we have here as our Bayes theorem. So, okay, cool. How is this helpful? What exactly does this do for us? Well, best way to really kind of explain and work through Bayes' theorem is to kind of play around with some examples. So let's take a look at an example to start off here. Okay, so here we have an example. We're saying that, okay, 10% of people are prescribed opiate painkillers. So, okay, we, let's, just, let's just write that down, right? So probability that I get, I'm just gonna write this as pills, right? Probability that I get pills is 10%. And okay, these are opiate painkiller pills, but same idea. Then I can say, okay, what's next? 5% of people are addicted to opiate painkillers. So okay, that's probability of, I'm just going to write addict, probability of being addicted to opiates is 5%. Okay, carrying on, what do we have? 16% of addicts have a prescription for opiates. So, okay, keep in mind, 10% are prescribed opiates. This here is 16% of addicts have a prescription. So, okay, that case there, 16% uh, of addicts. So that's going to be my probability of having a prescription. 
So probability that you have pills given that you are already an addict, right? Because, okay, given that you're an addict, 16% of them have a prescription. So 0 0.16. Okay, so writing down our information as we have it, what are we looking for in the end here? What is the probability that an individual will become addicted to opiates given they have a prescription for opiate painkillers? So, okay, what am I looking for? My question is, what is the probability of becoming addict given that I have pills? That's my unknown. Okay. Going through this with our with our Bayes theorem, it kind of becomes a little bit like, okay, wait, wait. Bayes theorem, let's just write this down again. Probability of A given B, that there is the probability of B given A times our probability of A. All of this stuff here, all over our probability of B. Okay, so what is A, what is B in this sense here? I find the easiest way to do this is to go for what I'm looking for. All right, so in this case here, I am looking for probability of A given B. So A is that somebody is an addict, and B is that they have been prescribed pills. So okay, going through pills, that is B. That is A. Oh, that didn't really work well. I can't really read that. Let's make it maybe make it a bit thicker. B, A, and then so this guy here is B given A. And now, well, now it's just a process of plopping in the values and working it out. So what do we get here? Probability of B given A. Okay, that, that's not bad. Probability of B given A, that's our 16%. Times probability of A, well, that's going to be our 5%. All over our probability of B. Probability of B was 10%. And we have, as a result of this, the probability of becoming an addict given that you have your prescription. And what does that work out to? So if we have 16% times 5%, all of that divided by 10%, we work out that there is an 8% chance. And so from that, we can work out our conditional probabilities. 8% probability that you become an addict given prescribed. That's our base theorem. Let's take a look at another example utilizing COVID and the rates of our false negatives. So taking a look at another example with Bayes' theorem, let's just again write down Bayes' theorem just so we can take a look at it again and know what we're looking for. So what we have for Bayes' theorem is it's the probability of A given that B has happened is going to be equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A all over our probability of B. So again, what we have to do looking through all this is we need to figure out, okay, what's our A's, what's our B's? My big step, right, is to find out, hey, what is this guy? What's the one that I'm looking for? And so, okay, we can read through this and kind of pick things out. One good way to kind of help us too, not the way we did the last question, but just usually, usually the question itself, we have a whole bunch of information, but the question itself is in our last line. So what's our last line here? If you received a test with a negative result, what is the probability you actually have COVID? So, okay, what does that mean? We have a negative. What is the probability we have COVID? So that would be probability of COVID given that we've had a negative result, right? That's my unknown A given B. So, okay, probability of A is the probability of COVID. Probability B is the probability of having a negative test result. So, probability of 
COVID, that's my A. Probability of having a negative result, that's my B. And then what else am I need to know? Well, this is COVID given negative, so what's my probability of a negative given COVID? So that is the probability of my test result says that I am negative, even though I do in fact have a COVID infection. Okay, this, right, that was our question at the end. So we know this is our question mark. This is what we're trying to find out. These three, these three are the ones we need to get the information from the question. So let's work through it. The initial COVID test, which was performed, had a false negative rate of 30%. It was actually a bit higher than that. It was about one in three had a false negative, which seems quite alarming. It's like, oh my goodness, how does a test like that work? Well, let's take a look. So false negative rate, that is, it's saying you're negative, even though you have COVID. It's a false negative. And the probability that it says it's negative, even though you're actually COVID positive, was 30%. Okay, it is thought that only 3% of the population is infected with COVID. So, okay, probability that somebody has COVID, that's only 3%. Finally, what's our last one here? Probability of negative, 50% um, of all COVID tests have come back negative. So, okay, half of our tests across the board are negative. So we have all of our bits of information. We have our unknown, which we need to solve for. So let's start plopping in information here. So what are we looking at? We are looking at first probability of B given A, so the probability of a false negative. So probability of a false negative is 30%. Probability of A, that was the probability you have COVID. Well, there was only a 3% chance that you actually had COVID to start with. All of that divided by our probability of B, that was the probability that you had a negative test. So that's a 50% chance. 50% of all tests were negative. Working all this through, what do we have? 0.3 times 0.03 gives us 0 0.009 all over 50%. And we get our probability that I have COVID despite a negative test, to be 0.09 divided by 0.5, that's 0 0.018. That's only a 1.8% chance. So what we see in this, right, is that despite this high rate of false negatives, right, you're like, oh my goodness, 30% rate of false negatives, because the occurrence of COVID is so low in the overall population, it's still relatively unlikely that you actually have COVID if you had a negative result given to you. So, okay, if you had a test done and it came back negative and you were like, oh my goodness, one in three is a false negative, there's a 33% chance that I actually have COVID. Well, okay, no, no, no. Your probability that you actually have COVID versus say the sniffles or the common cold, given your negative test result, is actually quite low. So bit of reassurance, bit of reassurance in that. Hope that helps a little bit to explain Bayes' theorem. Again, don't get too caught up on this. It's not a massive part going forward. In fact, it's very unlikely to show up on any D12 quizzes or on any exam going forward. What we'll finish off with is taking a look at contingency tables. Contingency tables are a nice way to kind of roll together our um, joint and uh, all of our probabilities we've been looking at so far. So probability of A and B versus probability of A or B. Bring it all together. It's a good way to either pull probabilities from a table or by building tables, it's a good way to identify the probabilities that we are interested in. So we'll take a look at that guy next. What we're going to look at here is the concept of a contingency table and how we can use these contingency tables to help us determine probabilities. So here we have a layout just showing, hey, maybe we had some kind of career mixer held downtown, um, career fair kind of idea. In this case here, we surveyed 100 students and we found out that, hey, a bunch of them are from UVic, a bunch of them are from Camosun, and then here we have it split up between business majors and arts majors. Keep in mind, it doesn't need to be a two by two. I could have a three by two, right? I could add in 
to this, I could have another kind of another column being added in here and all of that glory. Or similarly, I could add in another row and have some other variable being put in. But that being said, here we're just going to be dealing with our 2x2, two two, so let's just leave it as such. What we can do with this is we can quite readily we can quite readily determine out a whole bunch of probabilities, right? We can determine, hey, what's the probability that I randomly pick a student from UVic? What's the likelihood that I randomly pick a student from Camosun? What's the probability that I randomly pick a student who is in business? Who is in arts? All right, and then I can start getting more complicated. I can say, hey, what's the likelihood that I pick a student? So probability that I pick a UVic student, so that they are UVic, and they study arts. Or very similarly, probability that I pick a student and they are from Camosun, and study business, and right on and on. I can do all these sorts of different versions. So how exactly do we do this? How do we take this contingency table forward? Well, first thing what we need to do is we need to sum all of our rows and columns. That is, we do actually need to create this one bigger to get these summations. Oh, let's make that again. One bigger, and then same idea here. There we go. So I'm making my table. And not so bad. Not so bad. Okay, so taking the summation, right, this wasn't just E, this meant to be capital sigma for summation. What do I have? All my business majors all together, 30 plus 25. So what does that give me? I had 55 business majors. My arts majors, 45. My UVic students, 30 and 40, that gave me 70. And then 25 and five, that gives me 30. Now it should be that as we sum these, we should get the same result if we sum vertically as we do horizontally. So 55 and 45, that gives me 100. 70 and 30, that also gives me 100. So good, we're on the right track. Now what we can do is we can take a look at this bottom right box, this is our sample size, our total number of observations, or our total number of trials. You can think about it that way, right? We did 100 surveys, 100 experiments, and these are all of our outcomes. So if I wanted to know, hey, what's the probability that a certain student picked at random is a UVic student? Well, I have 70 UVic students, 30 that are business, 30 that are arts, 70 altogether. So probability they went to UVic is going to be 70 over all 100 trials for 70%. Right, in this case, I purposely made it out of 100 so that we could do this quite easily. Don't fall into that trap of just, oh, it says 70 here. Boom, 70%, because that is a trap. Sometimes these will sum to something like 36, in which case you'd have to do that value divided by 36, right? So don't just fall into the trap of, oh, you did an example of 100, it's always that case. No, no, it's not. Right, very similarly, we can do probability of Camosin. Well, 30 students went to Camosin. So 30 over 100, that's 30%. And then same thing going vertically, business majors, there's 55 out of 100. And then arts majors, 45 out of 100. We can then work out our joint probabilities or our intersectional probabilities. That is, hey, what's the likelihood that somebody went to UVic and is in arts? So, okay, that's going to be probability of UVic times the probability that they were in arts given that they go to UVic, right? We're going to have this conditional probability happening here. It's a conditional probability because, hey, whether or not you're in arts is not independent of your institution. We have a lot more going to arts at UVic than we do at Camosun. 
So these are not independent events. So okay, if we want to work this out, what do we get? Let's uh, let's make some room. Let's bring this guy down. So probability you go to UVic, yeah, we worked that guy out quite easily. That's seventy percent. What about the probability that you are in arts given that you are at UVic? Well, okay, probability that you are in arts is going to be forty. Right, there's 40 UVic students in arts. Given that you went to UVic, well, there's 70 UVic students. So 70, what is that gonna be? And in fact, right, we can do a little bit of a cheat here. We can do a little bit of a cheat. Let's just get rid of this 0 0.7. And let's write it this way. Probability UVic, 70 over 100. Right, and okay, Keith, why is that a cheat? Well, that's a little cheap because, hey, look at this. We're just multiplying these two together. So, hey, 70s in the numerator, 70s in the denominator. Those guys cancel out. What are we left with? Where are we left with 40 over 100? Or that there was a 40% chance of picking a student at random and finding out that they were a UVic student and an arts major. Right? In this case here, how could we also do that? Well, we could always just take this value here and divide it by our total number of trials. So 40 over 100 would very similarly give us this joint probability. So in the same way, probability that they went to Camosun and or a business student, well, 25 over 100, that's gonna give me a 25% chance of randomly picking a student who fits into that. So contingency tables, very helpful. Once I have this built, I can very quickly and readily pull out a whole bunch of different probabilities. Sometimes we'll just give you a table and we'll ask you for probabilities. Other times we'll ask you for probabilities and there's ways we can solve them like this, or we can take the information we were given and sometimes we can utilize it to build a contingency table. From this contingency table, or a few of you, it's actually easier to then visualize what's happening and it's easier to work through the results. Let's take a look at an example where we'd have to do that. Okay, here we have another example. We have all of our text up above in white and then I've color coded each of the questions that we are similarly wanting to ask just so that it wasn't one big massive thing of text that just your eyes get lost on. So, okay, we have our questions in the colors. Let's just ignore them for the time being. What do we have for our information? So we have, let me just get my highlighter so we can actually note these. We have 100 individuals who used an online dating site in the last 12 months. It was found that 58, so 58 were male. Okay, I almost just want to write that down. Male equals 58, of which only 17 were successful. So, okay, successful given male was only 17. Um, what do we have? Or I guess maybe that's, maybe that's not the best way to put it. Successful and male was 17. That's the way we want to think about it. There we go. Compared to the 20 females that were similarly successful. So successful and female was, successful and female was 20. Okay, based on the above information, we have a bunch of questions. So okay, we do technically have enough information here to solve everything we need to know. And we could use our rules of addition, rules of multiplication, general and special to solve this. What I find easier to do in this case, however, is to build ourselves a contingency table. So let's take a look at that. We're gonna build ourselves a little contingency table here. Let's go like this. And then I'll need to do my summations. And not the prettiest looking thing, but it'll work, it'll work. So, okay, I have two variables going on. I have my sex, male or female, so let's write that 
male, female, and then I have whether or not they were successful. So right now I'm only listing successful, but of course we would have successful and I'm just gonna write not successful. And then I would have my summations going on. What I know is that altogether I have 100. So 100, day, uh, 100 surveyed altogether. What else do I know? I know that altogether there were 58 males. So hey, if there were 58 males, I can work out that difference. 100 minus 58, that means there were 42 females. All right, again, that's just gonna be our complement rule. If this was A, this is not A. What else do I have? Okay, uh, it was found that 58 of the individuals were male, of which only 17 were successful. So the males which were successful was only 17, compared with the 20 females, females and successful. Okay, from here, I actually have all the information I need in order to finish this off. So let me just switch colors for all the stuff that is not coming from the question itself. So, okay, right, that there was actually, uh, let's go like this. This did not come from the question itself. This I had to calculate as the difference between those two values. Very similarly, hey, if 58, if 58 is just the sum of all the males, well then, if 17 were successful, 58 minus 17 were not successful, or 41. Similarly, if I had 20 females, oh, look at that, I put that in the wrong case. This was female and successful. We can fix that. Female and successful was 20, right? Successful and female, successful and female. So we can update that, 20, some number equals 42, that is 22 in that case there. Finally, all together, how many did we have successful? 20 plus 17 is 37, and then 22 plus 41, that there is 63. Okay, if I've done this right, a little bit of a moment of truth, 37 plus 63, will give me 100, and 58 plus 42 will give me 100. If these do not add up to be what they should be, or the same number, you've made a mistake, right? You've done something wrong somewhere. So it's always a good check. Okay, from here, what are we trying to find out? First question, what is the probability of randomly selecting an individual being a female who was unsuccessful? So, okay, what is that? We are looking for probability of female and not successful. So, okay, we could work that out as probability female times probability of not successful given female. Could work that out that way. Or, right, remember how our contingency table works. We could say, okay, Probability of female and not successful, that's going to be 22 divided by 100. So 22 over 100 gives us 22%. Gives us 22% as our probability. What about the next one there? Next one, what is the probability of a randomly selected individual being a male? Well, that one's actually pretty easy to figure out. Randomly selected individual being a male. Well, picking at random from our 100. 58 are male. So probability of male equals 58, right? In fact, that was just right there. 58% or 0 0.58, right? Not actually 58. That would be wrong. 58% or 0 0.58. What's our last one here? What is the probability of a randomly selected individual being either male or unsuccessful? Okay, so now we have this or showing up, right? This is not that intersect, this is now that union. So what are we looking at here? We wanna know 
probability that they are male or unsuccessful. I'm just going to go U for unsuccessful. Actually, what did I use last time? Let's keep the same. I used N for not successful. There we go. So probability of male or not successful. Keeping in mind, are these mutually exclusive events? If I were to throw a dart on the dartboard, could I be both a male and not successful? Male, not successful. Yeah, yeah, I can. So that is, I have to use my general rule, which will be probability of being a male plus probability of being not successful minus the joint probability of being a male and not successful. So, okay, how do we work that guy out? Well, probability of being a male, we just work that guy out. 0 0.58. Probability of being not successful, not successful, 0 0.63, 63 over 100. And then minus our overlap here, probability of being a male and not successful, 0.41. So working that guy out, what do we get? Probability of being a male or being not successful will give us 0.58 plus 0.63 minus 0.41. We get a 80% chance of picking someone at random who falls into that category if for some reason that was of interest to us. So that does us for contingency tables. That does us to wrap off our uh, chapter, our topic on probability. If you have any follow-up questions on this, if you have any issues with it, please feel free to post to the D2 l Frequently Asked Questions. Feel free to shoot me an email or to drop in during our office hours and hopefully we can get this all sorted out. Until next time.